You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the CEO and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people and investors who wanna grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models and analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We are going to discuss the buildup, the climax, and the aftermath of one of the most important battles looking back a little more than two millennia. Barry Strauss is joining us to talk about his book, The War That Made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium. To give you a little bit of background on Barry, uh, he is a classicist and a military and naval historian. Mr. Strauss is an author of 10 books. Uh, to name a couple of his other titles, uh, would include 10 Caesars, The Spartacus War, and The Battle of Salamis. He is one of the foremost thinkers and writers on Greek and Roman history. Barry is the Bryce and Edith M. Bomar Professor in Humanistic Studies at Cornell University. He is also the Corliss Page Dean Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution and series editor of Princeton's Turning Points in Ancient History. He has also served as Distinguished Visiting Professor in the Department of Defense Analysis at the Naval Postgraduate School. He also holds a PhD from Yale and a BA from Cornell. Uh, I'm very excited to talk with Barry. Um, maybe podcast listeners do or don't know this, but one of my two majors in college was history and I focused uh, my history major on Greek and Hellenistic history. Um, so Barry, this will be very fun to visit with you today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Cole. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so on this book, uh, you know, you, you're you're a specialist. You you are the genius in this arena for understanding the history. Um, but what inspired you to write about Actium, particularly in this battle? Well, first of all, if anyone who calls me a genius, I'm, I'm very grateful to. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shakespeare. Shakespeare got me interested in the subject. Um, it, you know, Antony and Cleopatra is just uh, a fantastic play. And uh, I've always wondered what was the real story. So mm -hmm. that's 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 what, that's what got me started. I, I, I think um, less sublimely, I had uh, written about Julius Caesar in, in a couple of books, particularly about his assassination in as the start of the story and Cleopatra figures in there. And I'd written my next book was about was 10 Caesars, about 10 Roman emperors. Mm -hmm. And Augustus also really fascinated me. But then there's a and so I kind of wanted to fill in the blanks between the assassination of Caesar and, you know, uh, Octavian's. Uh, conquest and becoming the sole ruler of the Roman emperor, Empire. But then there was a personal reason, and that is in 1978, actually in October of 1978, when I was a graduate student uh, and spending a year at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, uh, our group of students went on a, a trip, one of many trips from the school, and we went to the site of the Battle of Actium mm -hmm. outside the city of Preveza, Nowadays, very accessible. There are 48 different destinations you can get to from the local airport. But in those days, it was quite a trek to get there overland on the very bad roads of Greece in 1978. And our teacher took us to the overgrown ruins of the victory monument that Augustus put up after the battle, Octavian, who became Augustus, at the site of his headquarters. Um, and... Uh, we we're all totally blown away by this. Two of the other students devoted their careers to studying it. Uh, one be is, was Greek, became the head archaeologist of that part of Greece, and has done brilliant work on putting together the remains of what was this spectacular uh, monument that Augustus put up there. And he's in the process of publishing them. The other, uh, an American, so the Greek's name is uh, Constantinos Zakos, the American uh, William Murray, 
um, uh, at the University of South Florida. He's devoted his life to uh, Hellenistic and, and early Roman naval history. And he measured uh, the um, sockets in the monument where the, the, the rams of the ships that, some of the ships, a selection of the ships that Octavian had captured from Antony and Cleopatra were put up. And he used them to try to reconstruct what had really happened in the battle. So I was really personally connected to this. And this is a story I really wanted to tell, given my own interest in naval history, um, my experience as a rower, and um, my book on the Battle of Salamis. So your book begins um, from the Ides of March forward. Um, to your point about uh, Shakespeare, uh, I was sitting at dinner with my daughter a couple nights ago with a friend, and we were talking about the books they read at school. And, and just so you know, in full disclosure, Barry, um, our, our kids go to a, classically, uh, a classical education school, uh, a charter school here, which is just, to your point, it's a blessing. Yeah. And so, so I, mentioned, um, I mentioned that I was going to be talking with you and uh, she brought up Julius Caesar and then immediately started riffing into Mark Antony's speech uh, you know, from Shakespeare. And it was one of those moments that I fell in love with my daughter yet again. Um, but, but so that's really where your book begins. Um, you know, teach us about the immediate vacuum because everyone's very aware of, of you know, E2 Brute and, 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 and that from Shakespeare, but speak about the, the power dynamics that the vacuum immediately created. Yeah, the assassination of Caesar left the question of uh, who was going to rule in Rome, who was going to be top dog. Um, and there were a number of contenders for that title. Mark Antony, one of Caesar's uh, main lieutenants, was one of the two consuls uh, for the year. Um, and so he was in a great position to uh, dominate, though he had feared for his own life at the, at the time of the assassination. Um, the lead assassins, uh, Marcus Brutus, uh, Cassius, and Decimus Brutus, they all wanted to run the show. Cicero mm -hmm. returned to the political arena, um, and uh, he did great work in um, moving the Romans towards an, an amnesty. Um, but then there were Caesar's, there were others of Caesar's lieutenants and supporters. In the least likely one, uh, was his 18-year-old grand nephew, Gaius Octavius, who was with the uh, Roman army at that point across the Adriatic Sea at Dyrrhachium, uh, today in Albania, uh, and who, as it turned out, Caesar had named as his chief heir in his will and to whom he had offered posthumous adoption, mm -hmm. um, which actually was not legal according to Roman law, uh, but law wouldn't decide the matter. Nobody really expected this kid to amount to much, but he made his, his way back to Rome and he accepted the adoption, Became said, demanded everyone call him Julius Caesar now. Um, and the game was on as to, as to who would dominate. So why do you think uh, Julius looked to Octavian as heir? In other words, um, there, there could be an argument that Mark Antony just had as much you know, right or, or ability to fill that role um, why do you think Julius chose this young man? Well, I think it's a great question. Part of the reason uh, was that he was uh, he was part of, of Julius Caesar's uh, blood. He was a blood relative of mm -hmm. Caesar. He was his sister's grandson, uh, and that counted for a lot in the Roman world. The Romans were fine with adoption, but they did not like to adopt outside the family. Mm. Um, of course, it's also true that Caesar did not have to have an heir who is a member of his family, but he wanted to create a dynasty. So that was important to him. But there's another aspect as well, and that Caesar was, in addition to being a great general and a great writer, he was a great politician. Uh, he was a cynical politician. He's as much of a realist and cynic, cynic about human nature as anyone. And I think he saw in uh, young Gaius Octavius, as he was then called, mm -hmm. I, I think he saw a chip off the old block somebody who understood human nature, who had no illusions about it, and who knew how the power game was played. I think he had some doubts about Mark Antony and whether Antony uh, would be up to the task. Antony also actually um, was a relative of his, a much more distant cousin um, than, um, than, Oct than Gaius Octavius. But I think that Caesar thought Octavius in the end had a lot more, a lot more talent. And in your storytelling, you do a, a great job of explaining that Octavian was a learner. 
Um, and he kind of he kind of comes across in your, your storytelling as a steel trap mind, where he's watching events and he's making notes, and even all you know to where when he was with Julius, um, he was very much paying attention to that school was in session. Um, yep, yeah, absolutely. And you know, he um, when 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 Caesar on his, was on his last campaign in uh, in Spain in forty five, Octavian went over there to join him. Uh, he uh, had some health problems throughout his life, and so he was on a sick bed and couldn't get there in time for the, for the climactic battle. But he got there not long afterwards, and he spent six months with uh, Julius Caesar, traveling around with him, learning from him, no doubt sucking up to him um, and flattering him, um, and impressing Caesar as, this is the guy, this is the one. <laughs> So Antony blocked Octavian from receiving what was his inheritance uh, from the will of Julius. Um, what, was this Antony just playing politics and, and somewhat, I'll call it somewhat jealousy because he was passed by for an, any inheritance? I don't think it was just jealousy, though he was human and that was surely part of it. I think more of it was that he felt that, that he deserved to be uh, the... Caesar's heir. He deserved mm -hmm. to pick up Caesar's mantle. He deserved to be the one who would lead Rome. And I suppose less selfishly, he might have thought, who is this 18-year-old kid? I mean, the Romans did not, it was not a youth culture. Um, and they would automatically be suspicious of someone so young who aspired to so much power. So he had all sorts of reasons to want to block Octavian. So then teach our listeners about uh, Mark, Mark Antony's upbringing, because my context for thinking about Antony, I think of Antony as kind of like a Hemingway style character, um, you know, kind of likes adventure, likes going out, likes trying to conquer, and yet has some personal foibles that come with that. Yeah, there's no question that Antony was a guy's guy. You know, he loved battle. Uh, he loved, he loved war. He was, you know, swashbuckling. Uh, he came from an aristocratic family. He was, you know, pure-blooded Roman noble, which Octavian was not. And uh, so he had a very high opinion of himself. Uh, he, was a, he, was a, he was a great speaker. He'd studied in Athens, so he, he, he knew his Greek, he knew his oratory. He was a very intelligent man. Uh, he also was a great ladies' man. You know, he was infamous for his affairs and his mistresses, and, and he had a series of wives, which is not so unusual in the Roman elite, um, at uh, that period. But he had shown on a number of occasions, well, two things really. One, he'd shown that he didn't always have the best political judgment. Mm -hmm. He had um, uh, unleashed a massacre in the Roman Forum a few years earlier um, that um, caused Caesar a lot of trouble while he was away from home. Caesar had to clean it up. Um, Antony had, was a very good number two on the battlefield or a very good subordinate. But he never actually won a battle on his own. So there's some question as to whether uh, he had the right stuff, whether he had what it would take to be number one. How important was uh, his first wife, Fulvia, in kind of settling him? Because I think this is something that comes up where you know he's this brash womanizer and he runs this woman and, and she kind of tames him. Yes, so Antony uh, was, you know, a macho guy and an intelligent guy, but he needed a woman to, um, you know, to calm him down, to organize him. Um, he's not the only man in history of whom that is true. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Fulvia uh, had uh, came from a political family. Uh, she'd been married twice before to uh, Roman politicians, uh, and um, she knew how the game was played. And she also happened to be an expert in putting on a political funeral, which she had done for her earlier husband, Clodius, after he had been assassinated about a decade earlier. Um, and she probably is the one who whispered into Antony's ear and told him what to do to mm -hmm. turn his disadvantage into, uh, turn it around, do jujitsu on his opponents and turn Caesar's funeral into a, uh, a winning event, which which indeed it, it turned out to be. Now, in many ways, it was a, a copy of what had been done earlier for her her late husband, Clodius. So Cleopatra was also in Rome at the time of Julius's death. Um, can you teach us, teach our listeners about her background, you know, her upbringing and why she was in Rome at the time? Sure. So uh, 
Cleopatra was one of the children of the uh, previous king of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Ptolemy, uh, the flute player, Ptolemy Auletes was her father. And he had stayed on his throne by staying close to Rome uh, and being a very loyal ally of the Romans. Uh, he had mm, two or three sons and two daughters. And it was often the case of the these Macedonian ruling families. Um, uh, they killed each other. They made war on each other for the, for the throne. Uh, and Cleopatra was the last one left standing. Um, she uh, fought uh, one of her brothers, who was king, um, and she had been she had become queen, but her brother drove her from the throne, shared mm -hmm. it with her. Um, and then when she was uh, very young, she met Julius Caesar, who was a victorious general who had come to Egypt. And they immediately had a began a love affair. Who seduced whom, we don't know. Uh, but it was certainly to Cleopatra's advantage. Um, uh, Caesar provided the muscle that she needed to defeat her brother, who was actually killed in battle. Um, and... Um, she becomes the dominant partner. Her Another one of her brothers um, is then the co-ruler with her because having a sole female ruler was not really acceptable to the Egyptians. <clears throat> she eventually gets rid of him. Uh, her sister, who had tried to have her killed, she'd already had put away uh, in a temple, I believe, in Ephesus. Is that Arsinoe? Later on, yes, Arsinoe, yes. Yeah. Later on, she has Cleopatra orders her execution as mm -hmm. as well. And um, uh, the brother, who is her co-ruler, conveniently dies. But um, every reason to suspect that that was, that was a murder as, as well. She emerges triumphant as the queen of Egypt, and she has a very valuable prize. Um, her affair with Caesar produced a son um, who becomes Ptolemy the 15th. Caesar. Caesar gives her permission to name the boy after her, mm -hmm. after him, excuse me. Uh, the Alexandrians nickname him Caesarian, and that's the name that we know him by, Caesarian or Caesarian, uh, it's, often, it's often said. Uh, and he was the heir to the throne. He was her co-ruler. Uh, but she, uh, since her son was just a kid, uh, she was the de facto sole ruler of Egypt. Um, she uh, was still close to Caesar, and she came to Rome both to represent her country uh, and to continue the affair with Caesar. Um, uh, Cicero suggests that she had a miscarriage shortly after Caesar's assassination. Uh, so there's good reason to think that um, she was pregnant with another child by Caesar. It just, it just didn't work out. Mm. Uh, but she was trying to maintain her country's independence Egypt had come close several times to being annexed by the Romans. And the only thing that saved Egypt was first that the Romans were also jealous of each other. They didn't want any one of them to um, be the dominant figure in Egypt. And Egypt was very important because it was the wealthiest place in the Mediterranean because of the agricultural riches uh, of, brought by the flooding of the, the Nile and also because of the huge treasury the Ptolemies had amassed. The second reason why Egypt had maintained its independence is that it had a series of kings who knew exactly how far to go and exactly how to play the Romans. Um, so um, Cleopatra was holding on to the independence of her kingdom. So early on in, in this book, you talk about Octavian uh, securing two Roman legions to defect from Antony, um, he, he paid them. And I, I think he had even got the money because he didn't have his inheritance. So I think you said that he had kind of cobbled the money together through, through friends and to have this private army. Um, this became a long-term theme of, of obviously the storytelling, which was defection for, uh, from Anthony. Anthony. Um, uh, but this was the first instance he saw. And I feel like the entire story was like defection. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, uh, Octavian was just a very sly guy. Uh, and he was a master of turning um, the, uh, his enemies' allies into his enemies' enemies and his own allies. Uh, this, as you say, this is the first great defection. And before, in the run-up to the Battle of um, of Actium, there's a series of defections that really turns things around for Octavian. So, uh, sly and dangerous fellow. So Octavian, Antony, and Lepidus uh, enter into a triumvirate of leadership. Okay. 
And I, I look at this as it's, it's a kind of a temporary agreement just to not be at each other's necks every day. Uh, so it, c- can you explain, was this really, was the third part of the triumvirate there between Octavian and Antony just so that there was someone else there and they didn't have to go head to head? Maybe that was one of the reasons, but um, the fact of the matter was that at the time Lepidus had uh, controlled a series of armies, a series of legions of his own. Mm. So um, now maybe uh, Octavian could have worked his magic and gotten them to defect. But I think that uh, it probably made more sense for him, um, as you say, to have this um, this buffer between him and Antony in, mm-hmm. in the form of Lepidus. So the assassins of Julius were still at large, which was Brutus and Cassius. Um, they were cleaning house among the gentry though. Uh, I think you noted how many nobles uh, were, were killed, how many knights uh, were killed. Um, were, were they just culling um, Julius as loyalists? In other words, the people that believed in Caesar. Um, well, it's, you know, it's, it's Antony, it's a triumvirate, Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus who are carrying out these purges. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're, they're mostly going after Caesar's enemies. Okay. Um, rather than, than, than purging Caesar's supporters. Certainly Brutus and Cassius, who by now are in the East, um, they are killing off some of their enemies as well. But um, the main purging is being done by, uh, by uh, uh, Antony and uh, Octavian. So Antony and Octavian uh, you know, meet at Philippi with Brutus and Cassius. Um, this is a very strange engagement. Um, and why I loved the story, because it includes... Uh, the fog of war. Yeah, that's right. Can can you explain? Can you explain what transpired there and how the fog of war really changed the conflict? Sure. Well, you know, uh, uh, Brutus and Cassius, the uh, assassins, had built up a very impressive army. Um, now, Octavian and Antony had a strong army as well. Brutus and Cassius had a great navy, though, and the other side hardly had any fleet at all. So, really, what they should have done was sat pretty. Um, and waited to starve the enemy out. Antony understands this, and he forces their hand by building uh, a causeway across a marsh, a marsh that will allow him to attack the flank of the enemy army. And so the battle begins. Um, Cassius is successful, um, uh, but he thinks that Brutus's army has been uh, been defeated, which is not true. And so he thinks the entire battle is lost. And so Cassius commits suicide. Uh, in fact, they'd won. <laughs> they'd won that day. Uh, and this is a disaster because Cassius is the military genius. He's the brains behind this army. Brutus is an orator, a philosopher, a statesman. He is no kind of general. And now um, they're stuck with Brutus as their leader, which is bad news. So then, uh, obviously, you know, Antony and Octavian are victorious over Brutus. Um, and Antony's, Antony's looked at the overall victor because I think, if I remember correctly, Octavian had fled the battle at one point. Um, but I, I think you did a good job explaining that it wasn't necessarily Antony's success. It was Brutus and Cassius's failure. Yes. You know, Antony was successful because the enemy foolishly agreed to fight him. Um, this is a case where the enemy should have stayed on the defensive and starved out um, uh, Antony and Octavian, which is exactly what Octavian does at Actium. Mm-hmm. Um, they had, um, they, Brutus and Cassius had the upper hand because they controlled the sea. They had the navy. The enemy had no supplies. So um, that's the game they should have played. But instead, um, they go for battle. And, and that's what lost it for them. Even then, they might have won the battle, if not, as you say, for the fog of war. Sure. Yeah. So then Antony does a very Roman thing. He heads east to start extracting allegiances from all the allies of Brutus and Cassius. And and you touch on that theme later with obviously um, with Augustus or Octavian later. Um, but he also goes in a very, you know, Antony way, sleeping his way east with ladies as well. Um, but, but this was just kind of like a classic Roman mop up. Yes. Yes, it was. Um, it was a classic Roman mop-up. The only uh, caveat I would say is that Antony's long-term goal is to renew the military campaign that Caesar was unable to carry out because he was assassinated, and that is attacking Parthia. 
you know, attacking the Iranian empire of the day. That was, that, that was his plan. So he eventually ends up uh, in, uh, you know, Cleopatra's world um, be- and, and he becomes, you know, her, her partner and lover during his trip east as he's doing this, but she was no Roman, okay? Um, the other theme that your book draws out to really tell this difference between the power that Antony and Cleopatra had with, you know, the, the position that Octavian sat in was ultimately as powerful as she was, as incredible as she was, she was no Roman. W- was this really the fatal error from the beginning is that this woman wasn't a Roman? No, I don't, I don't think it was a fatal error. I mean, I'm not sure what you're driving at inherent. Well, in other words, it, it, it was, would it have been any different if he had tried to find power you know, through another woman in Rome versus this woman who obviously was known but w- was not looked at to be the future of Rome? I see what you're saying. Um, I guess I'm skeptical of the idea that a lot of historians have that Antony was doomed because the Romans would never fight for him. Uh, because uh, he had this Greco-Egyptian gotcha. uh, woman, wife. Um, I think he could have gotten away with it, especially if Cleopatra had not insisted on staying with the expedition, on going with him to uh, to um, Athens, from Ephesus to Athens, and then from Athens to, uh, to Actium. But because she was there, uh, it it really did cost him in terms of propaganda and in terms of discomfort that some people felt, both because she was a woman and because she was the queen of Egypt. Certainly Antony had other non-Roman allies and mm-hmm. Roman armies often had non-Roman allies. I don't think that would have bothered anyone. But it's Cleopatra's particular position, the fact she's female, the fact that she has so much power over Antony, both because she is his paymaster, she's paying for his armies, and because she's sleeping, sharing his bed, and is the mother of three of his children. That certainly did bother people. But she wasn't about to leave uh, because she didn't trust Antony, and she Mm. didn't trust Octavian. Antony had had spats with Octavia before and then had patched them up. Cleopatra couldn't afford to have that happen. So um, Antony divorces Octavia. And so he, Antony's married to Octavian's sister, bizarre as that may seem. Sure. As all the time he's having this affair with Cleopatra, um, he's actually technically married to um, a Roman woman by whom he has two, two children, two daughters. Uh, and he only divorces her a few months before the Battle of Actium. Uh, in many ways, this was a fatal error to divorce her. Um, uh, it did not play well with the Roman public. In other ways, um, it gave the message to his own army that he was making a credible commitment, that he had all his skin in the game, uh, and that he was burning his bridges and was really serious about it. Cleopatra was really afraid that even in spite of this, that Octavian would find some way to patch up a deal between himself and Antony and, you know, reboot the marriage in some way or other. So she was there. She felt she had to protect her investment in this guy and make sure he didn't turn on her. So um, I want to go to Octavia because I think uh, she's very interesting as it pertains to, you know, kind of the interim agreement that that the triumvirate comes to. Um, You know, the original agreement ended in 38 BC and needed to be renewed. Antony headed back west to do this, and, and Octavio, she seems like to be the glue in this negotiation. In other words, she, she helps kind of patches it together. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the trade was ships for legions, right? One had ships, one had legions. Um, uh, were they just kicking the can down the road? In other words, this was, again, they, they, they knew that they just had to come to head, but at least Octavia made sure it wasn't going to be that day. I think I think that's true. I think they 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 must have known, given the Rome's past history, that there was a good chance that this would come to a head, as you say. Um, and um, I think they were each trying. Each one was trying to build up his forces to be in a position to um, to win. Of course, they might also have thought, well, who knows? Maybe this time will be different. Maybe this time we can actually share power. Sure. But especially Octavian, um, it looks like he um, he wanted to go for broke. He wanted it all. 
Well, to your point, and I th- I, this was uh, this was one of your entertaining notes uh, in your book when you mentioned that Antony's marriage to Octavia was the old Godfather adage. You know, keep, keep your friends close, and your enemies even closer. And 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 to your point, you, I think you do a good job of showing that Octavia, uh, you know, was his wife, but she probably was not, you know, uh, by any means a friend. Uh, more than uh, you know, she was more for Octavian. Um, so. So in this triumvirate, though, I mean, Antony's east, uh, you know, obviously Octavian's in the west. I, well, the one thing that caught my eye and, and what made me think a lot about, you know, a- Antony was, a, he was like a legionnaire's leader. He was, not a, he was not a ship master, right? He was not a, a master of the sea. And a- Octavian, Octavian could sit there and enroll legionnaires in Italy, which is where Romans found their fighting soldiers, and so wasn't that just a, I'll call it a supply um, issue where he, you know, he, he had all these ships uh, from his relationship with Cleopatra, but that never brought the legionnaires that he was used to leading, which sat in Italy. No, he had a problem, especially after he loses a large part of his army, maybe as much as 25% uh, in his uh, ill-fated uh, Parthian expedition. He invades what is now Northwestern Iran um, and he's utterly defeated. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, has to beat his way home through uh, being harassed all the way. It, it's not quite as bad as it might seem, though, because there were a fair number of Roman citizens living in the East, mm-hmm. uh, and their sons could be recruited as legionaries. Um, and it wasn't completely impossible to um, um, uh, enlist non-Roman citizens uh, and, and turn them into legionaries. We have some from from this period. Of course, later on during the empire, that becomes the name of the game. And by the second century, few Roman citizens, few Italians are legionaries anymore. Sure. But in this period, it is a problem. So I loved your Roman beatitude. And I'll quote this from your, from your, from your book. Um, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, a Roman might have said, but not as blessed as the conquerors. Um, uh, and, and you touch on a very interesting subject. You, you mentioned that victory in battle was actually easier than peace in Rome. In a way it was. I mean, the Romans um, were, this was a militaristic culture and uh, Romans were expected to prove themselves in battle and to, to conquer, to add to the holdings of the, the imperium, uh, the, the empire. Uh, furthermore, um, Roman military doctrine was aggressive, you know, uh, always being on the offensive. Um, Making peace uh, was not something that was um, admired as much in Rome. It was important, but nobody got to celebrate a triumph for making peace. You only got Mm -hmm. to celebrate a triumph for a military victory. So uh, Cleopatra, um, you know, she had certain rights and privileges that you just didn't see in that world uh, as as a woman. Um, but I want to come back. So if, if it wasn't a fatal error for Antony to be in relationship with her, okay, that wasn't the beginning of the end, I'll call it. Um, were there, was there a certain subset of Romans that would look at Antony under her power structure as kind of a half blood? W- was there a subset of people that looked at him that way? Yes, definitely, definitely. But by the same token, there's a subset of Romans among the nobility who look at Octavian as also a half-blood mm. um, because he is only a Roman noble by virtue of his mother's mother. Uh, he doesn't come from the city of Rome, although he probably grew up there, but he comes from this town 25 miles south of Rome, Vel, uh, Velitri, Vel, uh, um today. And his father, you know, becomes... Uh, a senator, his father becomes an important person, but I think that to the most blue-blooded families like the Antoni, um, Octavian is an imposter. Uh, and this is an extremely snotty, um, rank-bound society. Mm-hmm. Extremely snobby society, I meant to say, excuse me. So as he's going into battle, Cleopatra, uh, Antony's coming into battle, um, you know, as a Roman general, uh, she's at his side accompanying him. Um, w- could she do this just because she's Cleopatra and she says, I'm, I'm coming with you, Antony? Or did, 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 w- was there any need for that? In other words, you know, who was really sharing or was, was someone taking? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, um, as I said, she wanted to be there because she didn't trust him. Mm. Um, she didn't trust Octavian not to come up, pull, come to come up with a deal, not to pull a rabbit out of his hat. Um, and she also was the queen of Egypt, and she wanted to make sure that Egypt's interests were represented in what went on. Sure. So um, why could she get away with this? In part because she was Cleopatra, the great charmer. Um, uh, in part because she was Antony's mistress. Um, in part because she was Antony's paymaster. She funded the army and the navy. They needed her. The ships had been built in Alexandria uh, by uh, uh, Egyptian Alexandrian uh, technicians uh, uh, and uh, shipwrights. Uh, on top of that, she bought Roman politicians. Uh, we know of one of them whose name, I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment. I've forgotten his name. Uh, one of the uh, leading supporters of Antony. We know that Cleopatra had given him a, a very important concession in the Egyptian economy. So he was able, to, he had this very steady and lucrative income coming from um, controlling the market in one, um, in one product, I forget which. Uh, so that's the way she, she bought politicians and made sure that uh, she would get a, a careful listening to. Um, there were Romans who wanted to send her home from Ephesus who said, she's got to go. You know, she's poison. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's propaganda suicide to have Cleopatra around. There are, are men who don't want her because she's a woman and there are men, Romans, who don't want her because she's an Egyptian. Uh, but she insisted and she got her way. So to use one of those names, I, I know I'll probably butcher it when I say this, but Ahenna Barbas yeah. uh, was one of those people who did not like her, but ultimately had to tolerate her because of the situation she was in. Yes, absolutely. Yes, he is the leader of the movement to get rid of Cleopatra to send her home. So you touched at it quickly a couple of times earlier, but um, I mean, just give us some gravitas. What, or what kind of gravitas did Alexandria carry in that day and age? Because it's a city that, you know, you think of like the wonders of the world um, and it had the lighthouse, but you know, it's not a city that's much talked about outside of a discussion like this. Hmm. It's kind of a combination of Cambridge, Massachusetts and Las Vegas. You know, it's, um, it is the great intellectual center and um, you know, it's also, uh, it's also, I guess I should add Silicon Valley because it's also a technological center. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in Alexandria not long after this that uh, engineers invented the first steam engine. Um, they just didn't see what any practical application it could have. <laughs> it's also, it's also the medical center of the, the ancient world. Um, and it is a glittering city, you know, known for its beautiful public monuments and its streets uh, and also, uh, it's Sin City. It's a place where um, there's a lot of decadence going on as, as well. Rome, by comparison, was at this period was somewhat Spartan. Um, it was not built up anywhere near the degree to which Alexandria was. Um, and, uh, you know, Augustus later on famously says, I found Rome a city of bricks. I left it a city of marble. The truth of the matter is he didn't even find it a city of bricks. Uh, it's uh, under Augustus, the technology of making Roman bricks is perfected. Mm. Uh, before him, it's a city of mud bricks. Mm. So um, Rome cannot compete with Alexandria at this time. And Alexandria is also just dripping in money. It's just so wealthy. Sure. Yeah. You pointed out how the, the commerce there was, you know, a big driver of, of that wealth. Yes. Yes. It's, it's a seaport, uh, both for uh, naval and for maritime occupations. So then Antony turns to divorce Octavia. Um, uh, did that have to be done? What, to your point earlier, was that his way of saying, okay, uh, this time is different. We're not gonna fight like we used to. It's, this is a different fight we're in. I think so. It didn't have to be done. And it, it, there was a propaganda loss in doing that. Um, but um, there was also a certain advantage because it, it signaled to his supporters, I'm not kidding. This really sure. is, this is not some kind of feint. This is not a bargaining chip. This is really a war and we're going to fight it out to the finish. 
Um, it also had a propaganda value in the East because in the East, Cleopatra was worshipped as a goddess, as Isis or Aphrodite, and Antony was worshipped as her, her divine consort, as Osiris or as Dionysus. Mm -hmm. um, and this allowed them to say, we really are together. We really, it's really the two of us against the world. We've gotten rid of this Roman. And the Romans were very unpopular in the East. Uh, they were considered to be, by many people, they were considered to be these evil outside conquerors. So Cleopatra, in a way, is leading a very popular movement against the Romans. Mm. So why was Actium the place for Antony to stand his ground ultimately? In other words, you know, you, you, later we'll talk about some of the issues that he had there, but what, what was the importance of that position uh, in Greece? It's a great harbor. Um, Actium is at the entrance to the Gulf of Ambracia. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is a very large uh, body of water. It's like a lake, except sea, it's, it's got seawater. Um, and uh, it provides this magnificent harbor. Um, it's, it's protected uh, from, from the elements. And this is an area where the wind, the wind blows up a lot. So being inland, but having access to the sea was, was really terrific. It's also along the way to Italy. So the way to get to Italy from Greece in general is not to sail across the open sea, but rather to hug the coast of Greece and then Albania and then cross at the narrowest point, about 150 miles, uh, to the heel of the Italian boot. Um, that would be the way to do it. Um, maybe in an ideal world, Antony should have made his base further north in what is now southern Albania. As, as I said, at the city of Dyrrhachium, that's closer to Italy. He doesn't do so for one or both of two reasons. One reason is that Cleopatra doesn't want it. She wants the fleet closer to Egypt uh, in, in order to guard the route from, from, to and from Egypt. And the second reason is that um, there's some evidence to suggest that Octavian had grabbed Dyrrhachium. According to the agreement when they set up the triumvirate, Dyrrhachium should have belonged to uh, Antony. But the evidence is not 100% clear, but it suggests that Octavian actually had taken the place for himself. So one of the questions you open up, and it seems like this is kind of debated and obviously we'll never find the answer to it, but um, the debate is why did he not just go invade Italy? Why did he stay in Greece and not take the fight to Octavian? That is the question. Why didn't Antony invade Italy? And um, I mean, the short answer is, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but the longer answers are, first of all, he may have lost his nerve. You know, it's, um, it was an easy uh, sail a row across the Adriatic Sea. That's not the issue. The difficulty is that he would have had to take a, a fortified city like uh, Brundisium or leave it in his rear, which was not particularly safe. Um, it's also true that having Cleopatra with him made it more difficult because she was, that would have been a propaganda net loss for Antony had he arrived in uh, Italy with the queen of Egypt as his uh, mistress and the lover, his lover, the mother of his children with her at his side. And the third reason may be that Cleopatra didn't want to do it, that, um, she didn't want to see this battle won on land by the uh, Roman legions, but rather won at sea. An Egyptian built ships with a large Egyptian contingent in the fleet. Pick one of those three reasons or maybe a combination of the three of them and you have Antony declining to uh, invade Italy. Yeah, the other theme that comes up in your story is um, you, you talk about, you know, if they want to go to war, you got to pay soldiers. And so this financial game was always going on in the background. I think you gave an example of Antony cutting coins that had more lower quality metal content. Um, and here you have, here you have uh, Octavian trying to figure out how to cobble the money together, which was really his biggest problem um, as, as they got ready for battle. Um, but one of the, the, the kind of the precursor issue in this battle was uh, the defeat of Methone by Agrippa. Um, that was a city that Antony had. Um, do you, can you explain what Methone was and, and how devastating this was to the campaign? Sure, Methone is a port um, somewhat over 100 miles south of Actium. 
uh, in the southwest coast of Greece, the tip of the southwest coast of Greece in the Peloponnesis. Um, it is a great natural harbor protected um, from the elements by uh, some barrier islands off, off it, actually islands, I'm not sure they're barrier islands. And um, it's a crucial point on the uh, lifeline, the supply lifeline. Greece cannot afford to um, feed all the men and Antony and Cleopatra's army, not to mention Octavians. You have to get food from somewhere. And they got their supplies from Egypt and Syria. Uh, it was transported westward on by a chain of merchant ships who had uh, sh protection by uh, naval ships as well. Um, and they would stop at various places in Greece, and one of them is Methoni. And from there, they having come from the east, having sailed east, north, east by northwest, uh, excuse me, west by northwest, uh, they now sail north by northwest along the coast of Greece uh, to Actium. But this is stopped, uh, stopped dead by Agrippa, who takes Methoni uh, in a very daring raid in uh, March of the year 31, thereby making it infinitely harder to supply um, Antony and Cleopatra's uh, army and navy. So a a Octavian took senators to the battle with him. Uh, w wasn't this your godfather principle again? Uh, keep, keep, keep your keep your enemies close, uh, or your friends close, your enemies even closer. Or I, I also thought about it. Um, you shouldn't be worried about the people in front of you; <laughs> it's the people behind you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean Octavian. Uh, you know, he wants us to think that he had all of Italy behind him, and he was so popular before this battle. But in fact, mm -hmm. that's not true. Um, there were a lot of people who preferred Antony, in spite of Cleopatra. Um, and a lot of people who disliked Octavian, they certainly, there were riots over the taxes uh, that he levied. And he was worried that if he left the senators at home, they might betray him. He didn't know what Antony was going to do. He thought it's possible that Antony could invade Italy and start a, a battle in, in the rear. So, yeah, he made them come with him. Yeah, and I think Octavian, he understood and um, the incentive structures that needed to be in place to tie groups together is something that Octavian did superbly. And obviously Ant Antony struggled mightily um, in, in that respect. Um, the other really uh, funny uh, story you had, um, obviously Cleopatra, she was a show woman. She could, she could entertain. Um, and one of the more entertaining parts of your book was when you included her quote, uh, when speaking about Octavian, she said, What's so terrible if Caesar is sitting on a ladle? <laughs> um, now, that doesn't sound like much in our day, but could you explain what, what she was chiding him when she said that? Okay, so he, was, he had landed at a place that's called the ladle in Greek, Terune, in ancient Greek. Uh, and I've been there. You could, you could imagine it looking like a ladle out at sea. Uh, this is meant to be a dirty joke about uh, Octavian uh, pleasuring himself, um, shall we say. Um, also, Antony had spread rumors, or his people had spread rumors, um, that uh, Octavian had been Caesar's, not just his grandnephew, but that the two of them had had an affair, that he'd been Caesar's boy in every sense of the word. So um, Cleopatra's playing on this. Yeah, so Antony's camp at Actium, I mean, he's, it, this just seems like disaster as, as soon, from Methoni on. Um, you know, he's there. And you explain the supply issues they had with things like water because of the, the landscape of the land. Um, Antony also had people defecting right up to the battle with, with Octavian at Actium. Um, wasn't this just this recurring theme continue to play out right at the moment of, you know, of trial? Absolutely. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, as, as we've seen, Octavian is a master of deception and defection and he is as as it's clear that Antony's not winning so um, um, the Octavian's fleet uh, led by his brilliant Admiral Agrippa uh, goes on to uh, inflict defeat after fleet defeat on Antony's warships um, and uh, causing ever greater supply problems and so uh, Octavian is able to peel away people from um, Antony's camp also um, one of them, uh, Anna Barbus, uh, who we saw earlier, was opposed to Cleopatra being there. Finally, he's had enough, so he defects and he goes to he goes to Antony because um, Cleopatra refuses to go home and he thinks she's got to go home. 
And, and he was the he, he was the strongest military tactician on Antony's side, I think, is what you explained. Yes, and nav- navies were his specialty. He was the, he was the best admiral that they had, and they lose him. Yeah, so Socius makes a run uh, to try to break free, um, and that 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 fails. And then the night before battle, Antony and Cleopatra decide to burn ships because they don't have enough people. Um, could, could, I mean, from a uh, uh, you know, if you're Octavian and you're Agrippa and you're watching this you, these these flames and the smoke rise, doesn't that tell you that in some respects you've already won because they can't man the ships they brought? I think so, and they would have known it in any case because they were defectors up to the last minute. There's a very prominent person in his camp named Delius, and Delius defects like the day before the battle or just very very close to the battle. So. Uh, Antony, uh, Octavian, and, and um, Agrippa know what's going on. And yet, Octavian is not sure that he's going to win. And he suggests to Agrippa, why don't we let them go and we'll chase them back to Egypt and we'll we'll get people to defect to us there and they'll surrender and, and we'll win that way. It's too risky to fight a battle. Uh, and Agrippa gently takes his boss aside and says, no, that's not the right move at this point. Uh, we're going to win this battle, so let's let's fight it. And Octavian had had, I, I can't remember if it was Agrippa, but he had had awkward moments like that in prior battles in his life. I think you told a story where in a similar kind of uh, chord where he was going to kill himself because they thought they were going to lose, and he was stopped. He was stopped to say, no, like we're not going to lose. You don't need to do this. That's a very good point. Uh, Octavian had seen with personal experience that um, battle was scary, um, and maybe he wasn't the most courageous man in the world on the battlefield. Um, so he is tempted to try to uh, let him go and then use what he's good at, which is basically <laughs> suborning treason uh, to get uh, various people to come over to him. Exactly. So so um, September 2nd, 31 BC, we're in Actium. Can you explain the events of that morning? Sure. So, um, you know, Antony and Cleopatra have decided that this is going to be a breakout battle. They know that they're not going to uh, be able to take all of their ships out of there, uh, but they want to fight their way out. And uh, they're willing to try to um, uh, attack Agrippa's line to make one last run for it, one last attempt. Maybe they'll get a lucky break, um, but they're not counting on it because they have uh, done an unusual thing. They have loaded their masts onto their ships. Mm-hmm. Now, when ancient warships, they had they were both sailing ships and rowing ships, but they used the sailing part only to get from point A to point B. When they actually fought a battle, they took the masks down, the masts down. They actually took them off the ships to make them lighter, uh, so they could get up to ram speed and 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 ram the enemy or board the enemy ship if that's what they were going to do. But in this case, they kept the masts on. Why? Because they were planning. They thought that in all likelihood they were going to have to make a run for it. And they wanted to have the wind at their back. And they knew that in the afternoon, usually in this part of the world, there was a a wind from the west, a wind from the northwest that would blow down in the afternoon. And they wanted to be able to catch the wind with their sails, which would allow them to escape the enemy, who would not be going into battle with sails, but would be going into battle just uh, just with, with oars. So uh, Cleopatra, the one question I was asking, um, why did she stay so long? Because they build this plan where she's going to break, but, you know, they knew things weren't going their way days before this, to your point about the defections and whatnot. Why didn't she try to make a run for it, you know, days, weeks earlier? Well, she was invited to do so by some of the, uh, some of the commanders in Antony's army who wanted her out of there. Um, that's a really good question, and I would think it's because she really, it's, again, she doesn't trust Antony. Um, she wants to make sure this this goes to her advantage. Um, also, maybe on some level, she loves Antony. She feels their fate is intertwined, mm-hmm. um, and she wants to get him out of there. She feels that if she leaves, he might either make a deal with Octavian or go down with the ship, neither of which would have been good for her. So maybe she felt that all things considered, this was the best of a bad series of alternatives. You know, it was known that Cleopatra was going to be, you know, making a run the whole time as where uh, Antony went into battle. And you bring up this kind of question where, was he always expecting to, to cut and run? 
or was it just opportunistic based on you know what what he had going on in front of him? And is is there a lot of debate on on whether uh, he, he was going to do one or the other, or, or do you think everyone agrees that he was going to run the whole time? No, this is debate. I mean, the short answer it's a great question. Short answer is we don't know. On the one hand, he loads the mass on the ship, which suggests he's going to cut and run. Sure. On the other hand, he actually does attack the enemy line. He does fight. So why does he do it? I guess I think it's because he's a Roman. And he feels, you know, I'm not a Roman man if I don't actually try to fight a battle. And who knows? I might even win. We have these great state-of-the-art ships from Mm -hmm. the Alexandrian shipyards, and the Roman ships are not as good as ours. Yeah, they outnumber us, and the men are better fed and all that. Um, But you never know. The gods of battle might give us a victory. So I, I think that's what's making him tick. So then you also talk about, uh, here's Agrippa, you know, maybe the greatest naval uh, uh, seafarer in military conflict of, of his time. And uh, explain the role that fire had in this, in this battle. Um, you know, obviously Octavian's fleet using it against Antony's fleet. Right, so after uh, Antony flees, um, uh, his men keep fighting. Either they don't know he's left, or they don't believe he's left, or they feel that, they're going to get killed if, or, or enslaved if they don't keep fighting. Um, and Octavian had actually enslaved some of the rowers uh, who fought for um, Sextus Pomp- Pompey, an earlier, um, an earlier uh, foe. Uh, and so what uh, Agrippa and Antony, Octavian agree to do is to actually use flame arrows to destroy, to burn some of the enemy ships, and they're quite deadly and effective. Antony and Cleopatra go uh, to Alexandria, ultimately following Actium. Um, and, and you mentioned that, that they could have rebuilt. Now, I guess, could, could, you know, based on what you know and in your expertise in the subject, what was the likelihood they actually could rebuild or were they ultimately just buying time in Alexandria? It's a really good question. You know, Cleopatra is not one to give up. And she does try to rebuild a, a fleet. It's destroyed by her enemies, the Nabataean Arabs. Roughly, they're, they're, they live where, where Jordan is now. Um, she had clashed with them before. Um, she, they, part, one of the purposes of this fleet is to go to India um, and you know rebuild their lives there out of the way of Octavian. They also toy with the idea of going to Spain. Um, and uh, having a redoubt there in the mountains of Spain. That's where um, others had held up out against the Romans before, though ultimately in the end, even though they held out for a long time, in the end they were defeated by the Romans. Um, I think she's serious, and probably because Cleopatra, you know, she's a brilliant mind, she's a strategist. I'm sure she's also thinking, and maybe these will be bargaining chips. Sure. You know? So, and also I, when you mentioned India, I think to myself, back to my history major, India was the legacy of Alexander the Great. I mean, that's why they, they had this, you know, understanding that they could go to India because of the relationships that they had with, um, you know, obviously the ruling uh, parties in, in those places. Yes, very good, very true, very true. Uh, you know, obviously Octavian goes to his Roman mop-up, okay? Uh, he starts going to the former enemies and, and, you know, explaining the circumstances and seeking allegiances with them. Um, but really this becomes, you know, there's so many of these defections in these alliances that disappear for Antony. Th- this just reads like it's his season of no confidence that, that people are voting daily on. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, they, you know, Actium was just a smashing victory. And I think that, um, and Antony had, had run away. He hadn't, Died with his men the way a real Roman was expected to do. So, um, I think he's he's holding a very losing hand, a very weak hand at this point. Of course, it was always possible that Octavian could have died. In fact, he almost does die in a uh, in a storm on his way back to Italy. So, um, furthermore, uh, uh, Cleopatra uh, and there's a mutiny of the troops in Italy. Uh, so, you know, they could have thought something might turn up. Sure. Cause, cause then he turns and this is like, this is, I think of this as like brilliance of Octavian. Um, and by the way, to your point, if there's anything I think of Octavian's life, uh, he had a lot of trouble dying. <laughs> um, even when he wanted to kill himself, 
um, so so he start, he starts negotiations with Antony and Cleopatra, but it's not you know it's not a two way you know negotiation. It's really a three way negotiation. He's negotiating with Cleopatra, and and he's also negotiating with Antony kind of separately. I, explain kind of the rounds and what was negotiated, particularly with Cleopatra. Well, Cleopatra, you know, um, she's she's Antony's lover, but she's also the queen of Egypt. She's the very proud heir of a dynasty that has ruled this country for 300 years. Uh, and she's a mother. She has four children. And she desperately wants to see her children survive, and if at all possible, for one of them to succeed her as, uh, as the monarch of, of, of Egypt. Um, and she wants Egypt to maintain its independence and not be annexed by Rome. She's willing to bargain away Antony. She's willing to give him up mm-hmm. uh, to uh, to Octavian, and I think he knows it, uh, in order to save her children. Even though three out of her four kids are Anthony's children, she doesn't care. So explain how Anthony's life came to an end, because this falls right on that idea you just mentioned, that she was willing to bargain Anthony's life. Right. Well, um, you know, in uh, she it may you know, we know that Octavian marches on Egypt. Uh, Egypt is very defensible by land. Um, There's only narrow routes to get in, both the east and the west, and there's strong fortresses blocking it. The fortress in the west defected to uh, Augustus. It is um, um, Octavian. It's commanded by uh, a relative of his. The fortress in the east surprisingly surrenders to Octavian, and some people think that Cleopatra gave them the message, surrender to this guy. Mm. But in any case, his army and navy, uh, you know, converge on Alexandria. And uh, Antony goes out and tries to uh, win a last victory, but he realizes that he is doomed. And so the night before he dies, he throws one last party, a ghoulish party, to say goodbye to his friends. And then he goes out and tries to fight the next day, but his soldiers desert him. He goes back into town and decides to commit suicide. Um, he's also told that Cleopatra has defected from him. That's Cleopatra, excuse me. He is told falsely that Cleopatra is dead. Just as, just as Cassius um, is confused by the fog of war at Philippi, so Antony is confused by, shall we say, the fog of power politics in Alexandria. And he decides to commit suicide. He asks his faithful slave to kill him. But the faithful slave runs him, uh, runs himself in instead. Maybe he thought his life, he'd be tortured if he dared to kill Antony. Um, and so then Antony falls on his own sword, but he botches the deal. He botches the job. And he's bleeding out, but he's still alive. And Cleopatra, who at this point has locked herself into her mausoleum with all her treasure, um, gets word of what's going on, because I don't think there's much that happens in Alexandria. Cleopatra <laughs> spies, don't tell her about. And she has Antony come to see her. It's kind of a, a tragicomic uh, way that he has to be hauled up in the scaffolding of this still uncompleted building. Uh, and he goes up to see her and then dies in her arms. So, you know, his was, you know, falling on his sword and killing himself. Hers has a little more myth and interest uh, to, to how you know, her death came about. Uh, teach, teach our listeners about how her life ended. Sure. So there are, there are two versions in the text, and then there's one that scholars have invented. So in the text, Cleopatra commits suicide. Uh, the more dramatic version, the one that Shakespeare uses, is that she smuggles in, in an asp, which is just a generic word for a snake, mm-hmm. maybe a cobra, uh, and that the snake bites her and poisons her, and she dies from, uh, from the snake bite. Uh, attired in her royal regalia as queen, she dies on her throne, and that's where Aunt, uh, Octavian discovers her too late to save her life. And her two um, faithful um, attendants uh, uh, die uh, die with her. Version two, which is also in ancient sources, says, nah, it was just more garden variety poison that she used uh, to kill herself. Because she had a history of drugs and poison. She was into that stuff. Yes, Alexandria is, as I said, it's the medical center of the ancient world. Um, and our sources tell her, tell us that she conducted these incredibly inhumane experiments 
in the weeks leading up to this, where she has her doctors uh, try to poison prisoners to see which is the least painful <laughs> way to die. Think about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and version three, which only is, exists in the mind of modern scholars, is she didn't commit suicide at all. Uh, Octavian knocked her off and then uh, pervade the suicide myth um, to make him to, to take the heat off him for killing a, killing a queen. But I don't buy that. Well, yeah, I think in the in the first one you mentioned, I think there was even there's kind of like a sub theory under number one where it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a, a single cobra. It was baby cobras because they can, uh, uh, you know, lethally provide enough venom to kill someone versus, a, a, you know, a grown cobra couldn't do that. And you could fit them in the basket of flowers, right? Which I, I thought that, man, that's, that's some creativity. I like this. <laughs> yes. I've sp you know, different herpetologists have different theories. I consulted one uh, for my book and I know that one of my colleagues, uh, an Egyptologist, consulted a different herpetologist for her book and came up with a completely different answer. So ultimately though, this begats the reign of Augustus Caesar as we know him with the death of Antony and Cleopatra and, th and then begins because um, obviously Octavian's got to pay off all these debts from you know, paying soldiers. Um, you know, he, I mean, he almost sounds like a Republican president here in the United States where it's like, hey, war's over. Um, I'm gonna send a bunch of you home um, because I can't afford you. We're gonna cut taxes and we're gonna go out and do a lot of business and and begins what we now know as Pax Romana. Yes, yes, the Roman peace. Yes, I mean, it, it, it works out well for the ancient world in the end. Uh, Octavian goes from being a warlord who fights other warlords to be number one in Rome uh, to being a senior statesman. Uh, who turns out to have a vision for how to end the civil wars that have plagued the Republic uh, and to bring peace to the Roman world. Unfortunately, for lovers of Republican liberty, it, that gets lost in the shuffle. It's mm. now going to be a monarchy and people aren't going to be as free. They're not going to have as much political freedom as they had before. Um, but the good that's the bad news. The good news is it's going to be a period of peace and relative prosperity. So things we didn't cover in our discussion um, that, I, that I loved in your book that, that uh, was, was late in it, we didn't talk about Cleopatra or Antony's progeny's fate, which it was very unique for each of them, was very interesting. We didn't talk about the triumph, uh, which I think is great storytelling of what he did once he got back to Rome. Um, we also didn't talk about how this ended the Pharaonic dynasty. I mean, what, what had been a longstanding um, you know, uh, ruling class there in Egypt, um, but but let me ask you, Barry. What 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 else do you think that we didn't touch on that you do think needs to be mentioned uh, to our audience? A good question. I mean, maybe what would have happened had it gone the other way? What was at stake? Um, and if the battle had gone the other way, I think the center of gravity of the Roman Empire would have gone eastward, um, and Alexandria would have become the de facto second capital of the empire. The city of Rome might never have been built up as it was under Augustus to become a rival to Alexandria. And uh, Antony and his descendants would have been much more interested in fighting uh, Parthia than, than Augustus ever was. Um, if the Romans had managed to defeat Parthia, then uh, Iraq and Iran uh, would have become part of the Roman Empire with incalculable co co uh, consequences for, for human history. Um, by the same token, it's not clear that Germany, that, that part of Germany and, and Britain would have become part of the Roman Empire because mm -hmm. the Romans would have been looking eastward. So um, really a lot's at stake in this battle. Well, to your point, uh, you know, eventually Constantine was going to be looking east. So that was an inevitability, even if uh, Augustus led, um, that was to come. So um, Barry, this has just been a total blessing to visit with you. I love this book, as you can tell. Um, it, it's a it's a wonderful piece of work, and I've I've uh, I always told myself in college I really want to go to Greece. Uh, and I'm 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 at the edge of my seat thinking I I need to go back to that again. So um, I was going to ask you uh, where can people follow you? Where can our, our listeners and our audience follow you going forward? It's really easy. BarryStrauss.com. Um, that's my website. There's lots of information about me. Um, I have a podcast, um, which I don't do all that often, but actually it's being released right now, uh, uh, a season about how to win a war. Mm. And 
Um, I have I blog uh, uh, twice a month. Um, you can sign up if, if you want for you s- to subscribe to that on the website, so you'll get updates and know you won't miss anything. Um, or just visit the website. It's barrystrauss.com. Barry, this has been just wonderful. Um, for our podcast listeners, um, I would argue you need to go double down on your Roman history by buying a copy of Barry's book, The War That Made the Roman Empire. Barry Strauss's writing teaches you an epic era of history, but also entertains you with the culture and the humanity that is timeless, as we've talked about. Um, if, you are, if you enjoyed our discussion with Barry, uh, go to Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a review, rating, or recommendation for other podcast listeners. For our listeners, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, you can email us at podcast at smeadcap.com. That's podcast at smeadcap.com. You can also send suggestions for us on our Twitter handle, at smeadcap. Thank you for joining us for a Book With Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.